everybody. Morning. Morning. Uh, my name is David Sorn. I am the lead pastor here at Renovation Church. Morning to you. Uh, well, with the opening of our adult wing uh, last weekend, we are pretty much finished with building expansion uh, on the inside of the building anyway. So yeah, that's a... Uh, amazing. Uh, we're, we're grateful. We're thankful for that. Thank you, uh, so many of you, for being uh, a part of it. Uh, it just means, it means so much, and God has used you, used you in tremendous ways. However, uh, we still have a lot of work to do outside. Uh, there's a lot of sod to go in. Uh, there's a ton of landscaping to do around the building and around the site. Uh, they're going to have to do another layer of pavement in the parking lot. So lots to do outside. Uh, that kind of construction work will resume in May. And then our plan is to do a massive grand opening of phase two of the building for the whole community sometime in August. And then we'll just use that kind of as an excuse to invite a whole lot of people in to tell them about Jesus again. So that's kind of what's coming up over the next uh, five or six months. Well, thank you, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we are in, believe it or not, our 15th and final uh, teaching on the letter of Ephesians in the Bible. And today, Paul's going to talk about prayer, which I think is great because I know relatively few Christians that could say, yeah, my prayer life is amazing. <laughs> Most of us are like, ugh, wish it was better, but I'm not really sure how to make it better. And we're going to get some help today from uh, the Apostle Paul. So everybody grab a Bible. If you brought your own, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. If you're using the one at your chairs, uh, we're going to be on page 801. Uh, before we start reading, it's uh, super important to point out that today's passage is highly connected to last week's passage. In many ways, it's just a direct continuation. And so we're going to concentrate on verses 18, 18 through 20 this morning, but I'm actually going to Start us back in uh, verse 14, where we were last week. Uh, if you were here last week, we talked about how our main enemy, spiritual enemy, is the devil and his minions, and they're constantly trying to attack you to get you away from following God. And so if we're going to fight against that, we need to put on, the Bible says, the armor of God. And so we're going to start back at the armor of God, and then we're going to move into our passage uh, for today. So we are on Ephesians chapter 6, so that means you find the big number 6, and then we're going to start at verse 14. So just find the small 14. Okay. Paul says, stand firm then, with a belt of truth buckled around your waist, with a breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, here's our passage for today, verse 18. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. And then this is kind of the ending of the letter here. Paul says, Tychicus, the dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that may, he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters. And love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. And that is the letter of Ephesians. Okay, so Paul ends it by talking about Tychicus, which if anyone's pregnant right now, excellent baby name for you. Uh, Tychicus is the person who literally brought the actual letter of Ephesians to the Ephesians. And what's kind of cool, he actually delivered the letter of Colossians as well. So a, a faithful companion of Paul's. But I want us to concentrate primarily on verses 18 through 20 this morning. So right after Paul explains the armor of God, he goes right into talking about prayer because prayer is the mode. It's the method through which a lot of the fighting happens while we wear the armor of God. And I wanted to read the passage for you in context again because I find lots of times these verses on prayer and honestly a lot of verses on prayer in the Bible are taken out of their original context. But prayer is in the context of spiritual battle here. It reminds me of one of the most famous quotes from Pastor John Piper. Piper once said this, he said, prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. 
it is not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for more comforts down in the den. God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so that we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in the world. Okay, that is the proper context of today's scripture passage, right? We don't read here that prayer is mainly for obtaining peace or calmness or comfort or like a vending machine for all of your pleasures. Paul has just said we're at war. And so put on the armor of God. And so stay alert and pray. Now, this isn't to say that there aren't other reasons to pray, okay? And we see that in other scriptures throughout the Bible. Prayer uh, is also a conversation uh, with God. Prayer is where we confess a sin. We pour out our feelings to him. Uh, we praise him. And yes, we do sometimes pray for our needs. That's Jesus teaches us, right? Give us this day our daily bread. But here's a really important point that I want you to understand this morning. And it's this. Whatever you believe to be the purpose or the meaning of life is the lens through which you will actually see the purpose of prayer. Let me, let me explain to you what I mean by that. Okay, so if you believe that the main purpose of life is to be comfortable, and that's your goal in life, or you believe the main meaning of life is to be happy or successful or for your kids to succeed in sports or for your kids to get an academic scholarship, and by the way, everyone in this room right now is going, oh, that's not me. I was totally the guy three rows in front of me, but it's not me. And I would say, I would say this, my suburbanite friends. <laughs> our schedules betray our words. Don't trust what you say. Look at what you do. And if your schedule is full of comfort, okay, you're streaming something three hours every night. Let's be real. What is, what is your life about? If your schedule is just full of sports, if you're working 70, 75 hours a week right now, then that is most likely, whether stated or not, the purpose of what you think life is about. And the purpose of your life, remember, it is the filter, it is the lens, I stole this from my kids this morning. <laughs> it is the lens through which you see everything else, including prayer. So if you're looking through this lens and you're thinking, yeah, life is ultimately about success and happiness and, and comfort and feeling good, then guess what you're going to pray about? You're going to pray about your kid making the all-star team, about getting a promotion, about getting more money, praying about living in a different house. You'll pray a lot about your aches and pains sort of going away because that's what you're seeing life through. However, if you put on different lenses, right, biblical lenses, <laughs> got this at Dollar Tree yesterday, was disappointed it was not a dollar, uh, <laughs> okay, and now you've studied the scriptures, okay, and the scriptures are going into you and your life is focused on what the meaning of life is according to the Bible, now you can say, well, the Bible actually tells me that my life on earth here is like a mist. It appears and then it's gone. It's like, relatively, if you think in terms of the continuum of time, it's like we're here for two seconds, and then eternity in heaven or hell begins. And so biblically, if you're thinking through these lens, you're going, I don't want to spend all my time in prayer asking about me being comfortable for two seconds. Listen, I think a lot of American Christians are going to enter an eternity of rest already rested. Because that's all we pray about. Help me be comfortable, help me rest, help me yet. But with biblical lenses on, and you're thinking about the meaning of life through the scriptures, all of those prayers for more money and ease and comfort, they begin to sort of fall down at least, not off the chart, but at least to the bottom of your prayer list. Because your primary concern scripturally then becomes for things like the lost, for people who are facing an eternity in hell without Christ, it becomes for things like putting on the armor of God and fighting the wartime battle that we're in. Your prayer becomes more focused on how can you live your life to glorify God. It's not about comfort. God might glor be glorified through your pain and discomfort. But it's rethinking what prayer is about, but you can't do that until you first put on biblical lenses and you think what life is really about. 
And when you do that, it'll absolutely change how you pray. And truthfully, I actually think it gives a lot more urgency to prayer, right? When I let my mind actually dare to think about the truth, and we don't do that very well as American Christians, and I dare to remember that the devil wants to take my coworker, my kid, my sibling to hell for all of eternity. And now I feel the urgency to pray, right? Because I've reminded myself to think rightly about what life is about. Now I can think correctly about what prayer is primarily about. Does that make sense? All right, good. Okay. Now, let's dive a little deeper into the passage. Let's just break it down. So we're going to break down verse 18 for a while here. So verse 18, there's actually a very purposeful structure in this verse, and it doesn't necessarily jump off the page in our a wonderful NIV translation, but you can see it in some of the more wooden Bible translations. So I'm going to read it to you actually from the ESV. So here's what it says in the ESV. Paul says, Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. It's just Christians. And so actually, in this little verse, four times, Paul uses the Greek word for all. What is he doing? He's emphasizing to you just how incredibly important it is to pray with emphasis and intensity. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to break down these four alls, because that's really the structure of our passage today, and we're going to talk about the four alls of wartime communication, because that's what prayer is. So, number one, Paul says we are to pray on all occasions. Now, this is really similar to 1 Thessalonians 5. Some of you may have seen this verse where Paul says we are to pray without ceasing, right? If eternity is coming and life is short, then prayer absolutely should be one of our main functions. Now, Having like a a regular daily prayer time, that's super important. But there's a flip side of this that sometimes I think Christians in America just think of it as like a checklist item. Like I got up, I had my uh, daily quiet time at 7 a.m., I prayed for the day, check. Or for some of us, it's like I pray before meals, right? Rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, (laughs) check. I got my prayer done. Now, okay, when you study prayer in the scripture, there's all sorts of different types of prayer. There is routine prayer. That's important. Sometimes there are just deep seasons of prayer, but we also see prayer described more like abiding in a vine. That's John 15. Or praying without ceasing. Or praying on all occasions. It actually reminds me, there's a really classic book out there. It's called The Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Have you never heard of this book? Brother Lawrence was actually a monk um, from a Catholic monastery uh, in the 1600s. And he was a dishwasher at the monastery. And in his sort of long and tedious work, he began to learn something. So he had to spend most of the day just washing dishes for this huge monastery. And he began to train himself to pray on all occasions. So he'd be washing his dishes, and whenever he felt his mind just sort of drifting to something else, like, I can't believe my friend, or what's the matter with this dish? He would train his mind to go back to the presence of God, just be with God, focus on God. It was pretty amazing, and he got really good at it, and he started to write some of his friends about it, and people heard about it, and people actually came from all over Europe to learn from this dishwashing monk on how to pray on all occasions. It's a really fascinating book. In fact, we have this book. I looked before I came to the service. We still have a copy in our Renovation Church library, uh, which is just down the adult wing. Um, And I would love uh, for you to check it out today. If it's gone by the time you get there, uh, you can just place a hold on it, and you'll get it in a couple weeks. Um, And so we want to pray, and we want to pray on all occasions. Another reason uh, that I think for a lot of us it's hard to pray on all occasions is because we've never taken the time to build up our muscle for prayer. A prayer, like anything, it's a discipline, right? And it takes time. It takes effort. I think of it this way. So I've been a, a runner for 15 years now. Um, I'm not amazing, uh, but I run faithfully three times a week. And whenever I tell people that I run, they always say to me, you, like, what? <laughs> why? Like, we're, I always get the, like, was someone chasing you <laughs> or whatever, right? It's like, why would you ever want to do that for fun? I, 
Okay, I think of it this way. A, a number of times over the years, um, I've gotten an injury, and I can't run for six months or nine months or something like that. And I always know when I get back into running after I've been out of it for nine months, and all of the cardio that I've built up is gone, right? And now my lungs are out of shape. When I get out and I go for that first run, it is awful, okay? It's physically painful. It's just a totally miserable experience. However... Once you've built up the stamina for it, it's amazing. The other day, I, I had a hard day, and I, I went out that evening, and I went on a four-mile run. And I was just listening to music, and I was talking to God, and I was just lost in thought for about a half mile. It's like, you ever uh, drive your car, and you drive for a while, and you get so lost in thought, you're like, how did I get here? Uh, <laughs> That happens to me when I run. It's this cathartic release. And I go and I talk and I process and I pray. It's amazing, but you have to build up the muscle for it first to experience the blessing of it. And prayer is really similar. A lot of us, we start praying, like, I don't even know what to do. And like, boy, it's been, it's been 25 seconds. <laughs> what do I do, right? But you've got to, in the same way, you build up a muscle for it till you get to this place where it's this amazing communion with God. And the best thing you can do for some of you in this room is just to start. Get back and do it again. Or start for the first time. Start tonight or tomorrow morning. And I want to give you some practical ways to do that. And we actually get that in our second all in the passage. So let's take a look at that. So number two, four alls of wartime communication. Paul tells us to pray all kinds of prayers. I actually find this kind of interesting that in the Bible it's saying, hey, mix up your prayer life. And I think that's good advice because for a lot of us, we just get stuck. We're routine and we just do the same thing over and over and we're like, oh, I'm just, we get kind of bored of it. And here's the apostle Paul himself saying, hey, mix it up once in a while. So I'm going to give you some ways to mix it up. Uh, one of the ways that we've taught often over the years here is by praying through the Acts prayer method. If you've never seen this before, it's just a guided prayer method that keeps you focused on diversifying what you pray about. And so you start with adoration, and you just, I'll do this when I pray sometimes, so I don't get just stuck in the, I need this, I need this, and I need this. You start, you praise God for who he is, you move to confession, what sin do you have to confess? You move to thanksgiving, you're thanking God for what he's done in your life, and then you move to supplication, which is just a fancy word for asking for the things that we need in our life. In fact, let me show you a screen now of all sorts of different ways that you can pray. I encourage you to even take a picture of this, or if you can, write it down quickly, because I want you to come up with different ways that you can pray so you don't get stuck. I want you to pray all kinds of prayers, like the Apostle Paul says. So another way you can pray is with worship music. Uh, my longtime friend, uh, one of our worship leaders here, Zach Fody, has taught me over the years that when we pray, when we engage with God, there's something about music that opens our hearts heart in a different way. Um, and for a cerebral person like me, that's important. And so often when I pray, I'll just put on a worship playlist. And that's happening while I'm talking to God. You can pray with an app. I actually love the Echo Prayer app, which is just an app you can put all your prayer requests in. You can set a timer in like every 90 seconds or so. It just cycles to a different prayer. It just keeps me focused in prayer. Go on a prayer walk. There's something about moving the body when you pray. Here's an idea. Stop talking. <laughs> Right? <laughs> so often, prayer is actually supposed to be a conversation, and we do 99% of the talking and listen for God. Uh, number six, pray on your commute. Uh, eyes open would be preferable. Uh, for prayer <laughs> postures, uh, try, try laying down. Try uh, getting on your knees. Try something different. Journal your prayers. Some of you are awesome at this. I've never been great at it. Sometimes, though, when I pray in the morning, I'll just sit at my desk, and I literally will just type my prayers, because I can type faster than I can write. But my brain just processes in a different way way when I do that. Or number nine, go on a, go on a prayer retreat. Well, some of you have heard me say this before, but one of my favorite places in the world is a wilderness fellowship, which is just over an hour away from here. And they have these uh, individual prayer cabins. So I think they have 11 of them now. They look like this. I'll show you some pictures. And it's amazing. You can go to this place. It's meant for prayer retreats. It's just $60 a night, which is incredible for what you get. And you just get away with God. It's on like a few hundred acres. They have all these prayer walk trails and a lake. And it's just amazing to get away and focus on God. In fact, there are probably some of you in this room with what's going on in your life lately. You just need to do this. You need to call them up today, go to their website and reserve something. So you just get away for a day or two or whatever it takes and focus on God. 
And I encourage you to try different things as you pray, even as we prepare for this major outreach. So next weekend, it's like the Super Bowl of the church, okay, of what's happening here. It's so important. And as we prepare to invite people in for the gospel, find different ways to pray. Maybe you set an alarm this week to go off at the same time the next seven days to remind you to pray for the people that you're inviting to come and hear the gospel. Because I'm going to clearly present the gospel of Jesus Christ for your friends and family next weekend. And this is such, I think it's one of the easiest invites ever, especially if you know young families with kids that can come to the egg hunt, which we're going to do, rain, snow, or shine. If there's 45 inches of snow, we will, be, we will be doing this, okay? Because the gospel, that's why. Because it's just that important. But be bold this week. Time is short. Make the most of every opportunity. And please remember, as God has been teaching us in his word this month, that the battle is won spiritually. You've got to prepare in prayer. We believe in this so deeply. One of the things we're going to do uh, this week is we're going to open up our worship center uh, over the next four days, uh, both in the morning and in the afternoons, for you to come in here and pray just on your own for people to come to Christ. Uh, 7 to 9 a.m. and 3 to 5, Monday through Thursday. The only caveat I'd add to this is we're taking out the tomorrow morning because we cannot guarantee that our plowing company will put us in the right order that you can get in here uh, tomorrow morning. But at any other time, come. There'll be worship music on the speakers. There'll be prayer prompts on the screen. You can come for five minutes on the way to work. You can come for two hours. You can come once. You can come seven times. But let's come. Let's battle together as we go out to win souls for Jesus Christ. Okay, let's look to the third all now. So Paul tells us that we should pray with all alertness and perseverance. Uh, It reminds me, you know, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he dies, he goes off to pray. He has the three disciples with him, and, you know, they keep falling asleep. And then he comes back to them, and he says this, Matthew 26. He says, watch. That's like, stay alert and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We are to be alert in prayer. It reminds me, there's this old uh, Winston Churchill uh, quote, in the very, very early days of World War II, just when Hitler was starting to take over the European continent, uh, Churchill was worried that uh, the British people were not taking Hitler seriously. And in an address to the nation, he said this. He said, I must drop one word of caution. For next to cowardice and treachery, overconfidence leading to neglect and slothfulness is the worst of wartime crimes. Now, I think this is important to understand because for many of us as Christians, the reason that we don't pray, that you're not in the war, it's because of our overconfidence. We just don't think we need to pray. And again, a piece of that is because, well, we live in America, and again, we thought, well, life is all about comfort, and I feel really comfortable right now, and so what do I honestly even need to pray about? And I would just say to you, as a teacher of God's word, the devil wants you to put on these glasses more than you could ever imagine. And he wants to lull you right to sleep, thinking that your two seconds here on earth are about you amassing money and pleasure. And you're going to get to heaven someday and go, I wasted my life. I wasted my life on amassing temporary things. Do not let him lull you to sleep. We are in a war. And in a war, you have to stay alert. Sinclair Ferguson, a Bible teacher, says it this way. He says, Christ is building his church on territory that has been occupied by an enemy. Alertness is always essential when living in a war zone. If you lived in Ukraine right now and you went out to get groceries, would you just ho-hum, go get... No, you would be constantly alert. That's what Paul is saying. This is one of the reasons that as a church, when it comes to prayer, our prayer meeting 15 minutes before the services is so important to us. It's one of the reasons we moved it right here in the central hub in between these worship center doors. And if you go look at it, uh, at the sign on the door, you can see another reason of how we think about the prayer meeting. On the sign, it says this. It says, prayer room, the engine room of the church. That's an old Spurgeon quote right there, okay? We meet there in the engine room 15 minutes before every service. So at this service, that would be at 10 o'clock, 
to pray, to ask God to move, to ask him to rescue people from the hold of darkness, to ask him to convict us of sin, to make us more like him, to move powerfully in our services. And we believe it is the engine room. It's right in the core center of our church building now. We believe it's the engine room of the church. And we want you to come 15 minutes early and pray with us. Here's what I want you to understand, church. You need to understand that the devil does not fear a smart church. And he doesn't fear an organized church. And he doesn't even fear a big church. He fears a praying church. What are we going to be? I'm not sure that, I'm just to be real with you, I'm not sure that we're a praying church yet. We've got a lot of people who say, amen, that's great, let's do it, but we won't be there to pray. Am I right? I think, it's a hard word, but I think it's right. We've got to build this muscle that we truly believe in prayer, and we don't just give lip service to it, because that is the engine room. That is what changes the world around us. It is the power of prayer. And Paul says, we not only have to be alert to the importance of prayer, we have to persevere in prayer. We can't give up just because it's hard. And that's for what's happening in the kingdom, and that's for even what's happening with people around us. You know what's really crazy to me? Twice in the last month, someone has come up to me on a Sunday, and they said, Pastor David, i got to tell you this story. They're, I have a relative who has never gone to church, and they're coming to this church. And lately, they grabbed a Bible. I had the same story from two different people, talking about different people. And they grabbed a Bible, and now they're in a house group, and they're pursuing God. And they had never, ever come to church. What is that? How is that happening? I'll tell you how it's happening. Somebody is persevering in prayer. They're not giving up. And they just keep, like the persistent widow in Luke 18, they're just banging on the door of heaven, saying, God, I need you to move. Stay alert, persevere. Okay, let's go to the fourth all in the passage. So Paul says to pray for all the Lord's people. That's for fellow believers in Christ. So soldiers of Christ, you're, just not, you're not to be just concerned about yourself in prayer or even lost people, but we're also to be concerned about our brothers and sisters in the Lord's army. That's your community of Christian friends, particularly your house group. That's why it's so important that you're in a house group. And I would say even more so, it's your small group of four, five, six people. Will you battle for them in prayer? How differently would you look at your small group if you prayed for each of them every day? I think it would change how you interacted with them. Let me give you a prayer challenge this week. Uh, I want you, when you pray this week, to try and pray for other people as much as you would normally pray for yourself. And see how that changes your prayer life, because Paul says, here we are, we're to pray for all the Lord's people. And then, as we move to verse 19, Paul adds this. He says, pray also for me as I make known the gospel. And I would encourage you here, and I would humbly ask you to pray for your pastors. Uh, I, would, I would love, it would mean so much to me if you would pray for me, uh, even this week. Uh, this next weekend, with our Good Friday services and all of our Easter services, I'm going to be speaking nine times next weekend. And so if you could pray for my health, if you could pray for my voice, uh, pray that God would be with me as I write this week and that he would use me to illuminate the darkness as I speak. Um, That would seriously mean so much to me. Uh, I would love for you to pray. And then I want you to look at the very last part of verse 20. The very last part of verse 20, Paul says, pray that I may declare it, that's the gospel, fearlessly. And then he says, as I should. And I love those words. Why does he say it like that? Okay, I, th- I think of it this way. Um, the-, the other night I was reading one of the parables of Jesus uh, with my kids, and in the parable, Jesus was talking quite frankly about the horrors of hell. Now, a lot of Americans, when they think of Jesus, they just think, oh, lovey-dovey, right? But you know, Jesus speaks often about hell. He talked about hell was the third most common subject Jesus talks about in the Gospels. In fact, uh, some of you remember this. Uh, we as a church, we taught uh, once verse by verse a number of years ago through the entire book of Luke. It took us 90 weeks to get through it. And there is a section in the middle of Luke where Jesus goes on and on talking about hell. I think seven messages in a row I gave about hell. Because that's what we do here. We teach what the Bible says. But we're reading this passage about the parables and Jesus is speaking about hell. And one of my kids just stopped. It didn't just hit them hard. Because they actually just let themselves think about it. And they looked back at me and said, Dad, is it really going to be that bad? And people are going to go there, right? Without Jesus. 
And I said, yeah. Yeah. Only Jesus can save us. And without putting our faith in him and his saving death, then the punishment, the just punishment for our sins, it's not on him, then it's on us. And then people absolutely will go to hell. And my friends, that, that is why Paul says right here in Ephesians 6, pray that I may declare the gospel fearlessly as I should. Because when we correctly wear biblical lenses and we think about reality as it truly is, then we should, every single one of us should declare the gospel boldly and fearlessly. We should remember that we're in a war right now. Not with other people, but with our spiritual enemy that wants to hold our friends and family captive forever. And so I pray, I pray, I pray, I pray that God gives you, even this week, a spirit, not of timidity, but of boldness and courage to go out and hold out the words of life, the gospel, to other people. Let me pray for just that. Lord Jesus, I pray over all the people of Renovation Church. I know so, so many of them are going out this week. They're, in, they're not only sharing about you, they're inviting people to come in and see what you are doing in this place so they can hear the gospel. Uh, be with them, embolden them, give them courage, give them the words to say. Uh, we pray now that you're already preparing the hearts of the people they're gonna have conversations with this week. And God, we just believe you are gonna do miraculous things through the conversations that will be have this, this week. It's in your name we pray, amen.